Well, hi everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob, the Science Guy, and tonight we have the uh, Mead Smith Cassegrain Telescope, the ZWO 6200 color camera, and we're having a look at the Iris Nebula. Just got the mount back from the shop; it's working perfectly. Well, hi everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob, the Science Guy, and tonight we. Well, my apologies for the brief um, echo there. I was looking at the timing of this thing and uh, making sure that everything was working right. I forgot to mute the uh, YouTube, but now it's taken care of. So let's go see how the sound quality is doing. I believe everything's working fine. Well, Judy, good evening to you. First on, first on scene as usual. How's the audio quality for you, and is the music in the background too loud? Looks like the color balance looks pretty good tonight. Had a nice shot of the Iris Nebula here, but then of course the satellite had to come right through. Thank you, Elon. Let's go see if we've got anybody hooked up yet. Yep, everybody can hear. Looks like it's just you and me right now, Judy. I guess they're not used to me starting perfectly on time. Oh, now we've got some people coming in. Got four people on here now. This is the Iris Nebula. It's about 30 minutes worth of imaging. I started a little bit early uh, offline, just to have something to look at right from the get-go. But this is the Iris Nebula. You can also see a nice satellite trail right there. Thank you, Elon Musk. Uh, tonight we're using the uh, the 10-inch Smith Cassegrain telescope. It's made by me. The camera that we're using is the ZWO 6200 color camera, and the mount is a uh, CGXL, and uh, that's made by Celestron. So we're doing pretty well. Our tracking is excellent tonight, as you can see. I I can't get it any flatter than that. I mean we're we're tracking to an accuracy of 0.21 arc seconds. And as you see over here in the bullseye on the right, all of the, all of the reference points are actually within the center circle. So we're doing pretty well here. And they're actually a pretty small dot right in the center circle. This is sharp cap that we're using, and I'm doing some live stacking. I've got eight, inches, eight images so far. And... Uh, we're getting some really nice detail in this nebula. So you see that the nice wave, the waves in here, the waves of um, plasma here in the nebula. Stars are looking relatively round. They're just a hair off, off uh, in a little oval, and we still have quite a bit of uh, noise in the background of the image. <clears throat> I think what I may do 235 uh, for the gain is normally pretty good for this camera. Uh, Unity is 102. I may drop this down to 180 and see if we can get rid of a little bit of that gain on our next image. So, let's see now. Do we have any requests of imaging tonight? Anybody have anything in particular that they would like to see? Hey, Papa G. Ah, good evening from across the street. I take it you're my friend Michael tonight. Yeah, I got, a, I got an email today that a, um, 
ham radio operator in town happened to notice that there was another ham radio operator in town. Uh, we live about two blocks from each other. And he never realized that I was here, and I never realized he was here. So he dropped me a nice note today, and I went over and spent a little time with uh, he and his lovely wife, talked ham radio for a little while. Now, Papa G, this is the, uh, this is the Iris Nebula. And we are taking three-minute images. This straight line over here that you see is a satellite that went by. But if you look at the Iris Nebula, here's what it looks like in Stellarium. I'll show you where it is. So here's the constellation Cepheus. Uh, that's King Cepheus. Next to him is Queen Cassiopeia. And that is just north of the North Star, so it's it's above the North Star right now. Cepheus is directly above it. So uh, I actually had a quick look at the planet Neptune earlier today, and I posted that in the community section. I was able to not only get the blue-green planet Neptune, but I also picked up its uh, large moon, uh, Triton. So scope's working pretty well tonight, and the seeing conditions are pretty good. I think what we'll do is we'll probably stop having a look at this nebula. So what I'll do is I'll uh, go ahead and I'll stop the guiding. And then I'm going to stop taking the images. And there it is. Let's get a quick snapshot of that. That's not a really good image tonight because there's still a lot of noise in it, and I probably won't stick that up. But I think what we're going to do is we're going to go over and have a quick look at Jupiter. Jupiter is very easy to see in the sky right now. It's due east of us. And as you can see, the telescope hub is starting to move. And it's going to come down here to the ecliptic, and we'll have a look at Jupiter. And while that's moving, let's check out the chat and see what's going on over here. Real Cygnus is here. How you doing, my friend? Yep. Yeah, it's George. Gotcha. What did I call you earlier? Michael? I don't know why I called you Michael. Your name's George. But yeah, glad to have you with us tonight. Yeah, Cygnus, we're going to go over and have a quick look at Jupiter just, just for fun. So the scope's coming over there now. Let's go ahead and... Um, Get back over here to Sharp Cap. We're going to go ahead and drop the um, exposure time from 180 seconds down to about two seconds, and we'll see what we got. And there's Jupiter. <coughs> now, I can manually center that. Now here's the problem that you run into with planetary imaging. Um, if your exposure is high enough to see the moons, Jupiter's all blown out. If your exposure is low enough to see the bands on Jupiter, you can't see the moons anymore. Yeah, I think that's pretty close enough to center. So we've got one, two, three moons that I can see, and then four is right out here to the right. And if you compare that to what it should be in Stellarium, we'll go ahead and have a quick look at that. So we've got the two moons here, one here, and then one out here. 
And if you look at the image, there's the two moons, another one right next to it, and the fourth one is out here. So we've got all our moons. Let's go ahead and increase the uh, magnitude of this just a little bit. So there's three of our moons. The fourth one is off the screen now. But what we'll do, so let's go ahead and drop this down to about a 15th of a second. Now it's still blown out, but now at least we can play with it a little bit. So we're gonna start dropping it down a little bit. So there's Jupiter. Yeah, that's not too bad. Notice it's a little bit fuzzy. And the reason for that is even though uh, the atmosphere is pretty calm tonight, there's still winds up there. And as a result, very tiny bright objects like Jupiter will tend to shimmer a little bit. So the technique for taking uh, the pretty pictures of the planets that you see uh, in magazines and stuff is you take about 10, you take a movie uh, with about 10,000 images in it. And then you look uh, for the 25 clear, the 25 percent of the clearest images. And then you stack those and then you can quit, then you can, um, you can sharpen that artificially a little bit, you know, just to kind of get a little better detail. And that's where you see those beautiful, sharp pictures of Jupiter. But this is what it actually looks like live through a telescope. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, Jupiter is relatively close. Is Scorpius visit visible? Uh, no. I don't believe it is right now. Because I was born in October, which meant that Libra is in the sun right now. And since Scorpio is right next to October, uh, Scorpio is right next to the sun. So it may be visible at either, you know, right at dawn or right at dusk, but it's not something that we should be able to see right now. So... Well, there's Jupiter for you. Let's see where Saturn is right now. Yeah, we should be able to hit that. <coughs> okay, so right now what's happening is the scope is going and going, flipping over the meridian, and it's going to approach it from the, um, the western side of south. Let's see how high that is.
Looks like it's about 33 degrees off the horizon, so it'll be right at the top of my trees. Well, we should be able to hit it. At least get a, glim a glimpse of it. We still have a few clouds right now, too. We've got some high altitude clouds. It should clear up even more in about an hour. But it's not bad out there, that said. Wondering if the domes had a chance to catch up. Yeah, you see the dome's still coming around. And there it is. doing something called plate solving right now. Because that's so bright right there, I'm, it's probably having some problems picking up the stars. And it may, not, it may not be able to identify what it's actually looking at, but we can see, yeah, it won't do it. We can actually see uh, Saturn right there. So we'll just go ahead and manually move it over a little. Whenever you're looking at an object, you always try and look at it right in the center of the field if possible. Get the fewest distortions that way. All right, that's pretty good right there. So here we've got a couple of the moons of Saturn. We'll go ahead and have a quick look at it in Stellarium, see what it's supposed to look like. So here's what Saturn's going to look like now, and as you see, we've got three moons over here, three moons over here, and we've actually got two little ones right here next to the rings. Let's see if we can resolve any of those. So that's obviously way too much light. So we're getting a little view of Saturn right now. Let's go ahead and bump this up just a little bit, see if we can pick out some of those moons. Not really seeing too much. Bring 
bring that up to about 150 percent. So you see, even though the focus is pretty good, you know, we're right around 30 percent or 30 degrees above the horizon, so that we're going through kind of thick air here. We do also have some wind. I'm not really seeing a whole lot in the line of the moons. We were able to see Neptune, and I actually got one of the moons of Neptune earlier today. I put that in the community section of our post, or of the page, of the YouTube channel. About a quarter of a second exposure here. We'll see what it looks like. Bring this down to a gain of 102, which is unity. I think that's too bad that's definitely Saturn you can see some banding in it uh, you can see the you can see the ring of Saturn coming across the planet right here and you can actually make out some banding right here you know just below it Here's the focuser. Not really getting a, a lot of good stuff with this. I might go over to Nina for a minute and uh, do a little focusing over there and see what it looks like. Yeah, you don't see my cursor? I don't know if I answered you, but uh, Jupiter is almost at opposition. I mean, it's close to us right now. I don't have the, um, I don't have the outside... Uh, screens i've got those two screen extensions i put on either side that way you can see my cursor um, i'm not doing that right now but what i can do is i can just put an xx you know next to what i'm talking about and you can see that pretty easily Go on over here and check the focus real quick. And while we're doing that, let's check the chat and see what's going on out there. Yeah, so right now what I'm doing is a focusing routine with a program called Nina, which is what controls my, um, my dome and my observatory. I have the option of using SharpCap uh, for things like uh, plate solving and imaging, but the focuser is better on uh, Nina. Plate solving is pretty good on Nina as well. 
and uh, I, I have to have Nina going because that makes the dome track the telescope. <coughs> Another program you can use for uh, taking images is something called um, astrophotography tool, and that's got nice plate solving in it. and such. So does anybody have any requests of anything they want to see tonight? Uh, if you go to um, any of a variety of astronomy uh, sources, you can find out what's in the sky tonight, or you can uh, look at Stellarium, or we'll look at it here in just a second. So while we're doing that, Let's open up something called SkyTrack. I tried this earlier this evening, and for some reason it is not connecting well with the mount tonight. I don't know why. You know, it connects, but it doesn't move the uh, mount. But these are all the things that we can see tonight. Bubble Nebula is at 71 degrees altitude and north. That's kind of a cool little nebula. The Eagle Nebula is in the east at 22, which is a little bit low. You really don't want to look at targets under about 30 degrees. The Andromeda Galaxy is just far too large for us to look at. Uh, our field of view here is about 30 seconds, 30 arc seconds by 30 arc seconds, or about half an arc minute. Boy, that focus routine looks terrible. That must be because the planet's sitting right in the middle there. I think we're going to go ahead and just stop that. We're going to focus it at a different location. So let's go see what's going around tonight. Let's look at Bubble Nebula. Here's the Bubble Nebula. Now, as you see, it it's high in the sky right now. It's getting ready. Uh, it just passed the transit north. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and just have a look over at that. And we'll follow that. We'll follow the we'll follow that on uh, Stellarium and see where the scope is. So it should be coming over here towards the north, and here is the North Star. The Bubble Nebula, as I recall, is up in this general area here. Let's see. So it's up here. Let's have a look and see if we can see anything here. First thing that we have to do is we have to make sure that the um, dome tracked properly. Make sure the opening of the dome is in front of the telescope. All right, good. So we've got stars out there. Let's do an autofocus in a star field. So let's see what the bubble nebula is going to look like. Bring that to the center and we'll zoom in on it. This is why they call it the bubble nebula, is this object right here in the center. It looks like a big soap bubble. It's actually a pretty nebula. 
And it's high in the sky right now, which will cut down on the light pollution, which is a good thing because we're running into a big problem with light pollution tonight. That's what that green background is. Oh, you want me to explain the uh, graph a little bit? Well, let's go look at it real quick. So, that'll continue to run, but we'll just go on over here. So, if you look at the top of this page, you'll see uh, a stock image of the bubble nebula. And then you'll, you'll see some green boxes over here that, you know, say, go look at it now or let's make it a sequence for later. But in between, we have the altitude of the object. So, on the bottom here is the right ascension in hours. And uh, in, in going at the top here, you know, on the, on the left side, this is the number of degrees above the horizon. So as time goes on, as the, uh, as the object rotates through the sky, you'll see it's rising. Actually, it'll start over here on the right side. It'll go this way because it's towards the north. But uh, it'll start rising to the point that it transits through the north celestial pole, which is its highest point in the sky. The vertical line that you see is our current time right now. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. That's not right ascension on the bottom. That's time. That's our time right now. I, I'm sorry. I misspoke there. But the solid line that you see curving upward and then coming back down is how high it is off the horizon. So as you see right now, it's a little over 60 degrees above the horizon. So that means it'll be a really nice view for us. So, sorry about that. I apologize for misspeaking there. Let's go see what the... Boy, that is just awful. We're not getting a very good uh, focus routine going tonight. Let's go ahead and fix it to where it was, which was 10,000. And we're going to see whether or not maybe we can get a better focus routine with this. I was getting really nice focusing routines earlier. So let's stop that and just redo it. So what it should do now is go back to the original spot and we're going to try and rerun re that focusing routine using uh, 10,000 steps between each focusing point. The number of steps between each focusing point has to do with the autofocuser that you're using. And what you want to do is you want to see a visible difference between each step and you want to see in the end a nice V shape. And your optimal focus is at the bottom of the V. So let's let that run for a minute and see what happens. We may have had a cloud come overhead or something like that. So we'll give that a, a moment to run. I'll let you watch the focus routine run.
I'm just going to take a moment and put this back to where it was supposed to be focused, which was 200,000. That was supposed to be my beginning focus. I'm going to see whether or not it picks it up a little better. For some reason, it was up around 300,000, and it shouldn't have been that high. That might have had something to do with the problem. It wouldn't focus properly. Okay, this one seems to be moving a little bit better. Give it just a moment. Yeah, this is definitely working a little better. See, the focus graph is the one there on the right. We're just going to let this focus kind of correct here a little bit. It's taken a minute. Then we're going to have a quick look at the bubble nebula. Hey, Steve.
kind of struggling with focus tonight for some reason. Let me go check the dome. I'll be back in a minute. Well, there's the problem. The dome aperture was cutting off about half of the um, telescope. And as a result, it wasn't focusing properly. So what we'll do, now that that's fixed. OK, that's a good place there. So we'll go ahead and do another autofocus on it. And it should be a lot better now. I was noticing that the stars were kind of C-shaped. That indicates that they should be round donuts when it's out of focus. If they're C-shaped, it means something's blocking part of the starlight. That generally means the dome is cutting off the telescope, and that was exactly what was happening. So we should do a little better on this one. Let's see. Sorry, it's taking a couple minutes to get this focused, but you really want to get that right. See how we're starting to get some donuts in there now? See how they're nice round holes with a, a clear center?
The fact that that black dot is right in the center there is an uh, indication that it's a good collimation. But this is not going to be a successful focusing. I'm going to have to fix something out there real quick. It'll just take a second. Not a big deal. So we'll go ahead and stop that focusing run. Come on. Come on. where I want that. Let's go ahead and take some images. Back in a sec. Yeah, this isn't going to be anything that's going to be a delay. I'm just kind of fixing a focused issue here real quick.
Okay, so while this is running, I'm going to explain to you what happened here. Uh, the telescope itself is almost pointing straight up at the zenith. Now, with SCT telescopes, when you use the focuser that's on the telescope itself, your final turn has to be counterclockwise. The reason for that is that on an SCT, the telescope focuses by moving the primary mirror back and forth. Now, if you make your final turn in a clockwise direction, what you're doing is you're pushing the, the mirror forward towards the front of the telescope. If you do it in a clockwise manner, you're actually pulling away, and as you bring it up to the zenith, gravity can cause that primary mirror to fall down a little bit more, and it'll go out of focus. So it's just a technique that you have to do with schmidt cassegrain telescopes. So what I went out there and did was the, the way that I focus this telescope is there's actually a draw focuser on the back of it. So I set the mirror and then I do the fine focus with the draw focuser. It's very much like a Ritchie Crateon. And what I'm doing now is I brought the mirror to, to focus using a Batonoff mask at a, uh, a step number of 200,000 on the focuser. Uh, the robotic focuser and what it did was that kind of brought it back to where where I needed it and now I'm using the play of the robotic focuser to make the fine focusing adjustments and as you see it's already working a lot better see that V pattern er emerging so even though the focus isn't real good right now I'm starting to get a good V pattern again and the the base, of, the point of that V on the bottom is the point of maximum focus. And I'm a little disturbed by the fact that that's reading around 3.45, which is the half flux radius. It should be down below 2, and uh, or in the area of 2. So hopefully we're going to be able to get this thing focused a little bit better. It doesn't look bad, but, you know, it's just one of those things that I know it could be better. Let's see where the focus is here. It's at 200,000. Let's just kind of do a manual focus on this a little bit. See, I've got a little bit of a donut with a dark center to it. Those are already a little bit better. Let's bring it in another thousand, call it good. 200,000 should be very close, and we're at 198 right now. So let's see what this next image looks like. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. All right, so. Let's turn that off. Let's go ahead and find the bubble nebula. We'll plate solve it real quick. And then it should take us right to the bubble nebula.
Okay, so now it's going to zero it down on the bubble nebula. It did solve it. It'll do another shot here real quick and resolve it to make sure it's right where it's supposed to be. Bubble Nebula should be right in the center of the field. Okay. Now, this, is, this particular program is really nice for looking for asteroids and things. But to be honest with you, I, I prefer, when I'm taking images of things, I like to actually do it in sharp cap so I can live stack it. And that's what we're going to do right now. So we'll just turn the camera on and sharp cap. That'll just be a moment. Let's take a four or an eight, eight second image. See what things look like. Okay, the bubble nebula should be right here. We're going to double check it just to make sure in, in sharp cap. Then we're going to start taking some imaging. Okay. So we're dead on right now. So let's go ahead and start, start guiding. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take, a, let's take a two minute image and see what that looks like. Two minute, that'll be the bubble nebula. Going to hit live stack, normalize. Normalize, normalize. All right, now we'll just go ahead and let that image. And while we're doing that, let's check out the, uh, the chat and see if anything's going on over here. All right, four and a half inch Newton. Newtonian is a really nice, nice telescope. Those are, the, Newtonian telescopes are a ref or ref reflector telescopes that have the eyepiece on the side of it up by the front are really nice for wide field and relatively low magnification objects. So uh, they're real good for looking at the moon. You can see the planets with it. They're primarily visual scopes and they're really nice. So that's a good choice. They're a lot easier to collimate, for example, than a Smith Cassegrain. You just need a laser and, and call it a day. Yes, Steve, you're the only one that thinks it's funny when I talk about my personal dome. I actually have a remote control Wi-Fi camera that I will be installing in the dome uh, when, I, when I have sufficient motivation. Uh, I've got bad weather for a few days coming up this week. Uh, I've got good weather tonight and good weather tomorrow. And I will probably install a camera out there tomorrow so that I don't have to go out because I honestly hate going out in the damn snow uh, and dealing with this crap. Yeah, uh, this is really nice because I do this all remote control. And uh, because the weather is bad here in Michigan, uh, we either have bugs in the summer or you have snow and cold in the winter. And uh, quite frankly, I kind of like doing it from inside the house. Uh, Lubo in China did the bubble nebula last week. It's a great target, I absolutely agree. Rasses are almost impossible to collimate without having proper equipment. SCTs are also very difficult to properly collimate. 
um, because a lot of people think that all you have to do is use the three little collimation screws up on the front. That's not correct. You have to make sure that your, your visual back, where the eyepiece goes, is square with your primary mirror. And most of the time it's not, so you have to put a tilt plate in there. And then you have to, make, you have, to have some way of checking the alignment. And I use something called a Hotec Advanced SC Collimator that does that alignment. So, and it made a huge difference. The RASs are actually a nightmare because they have to be collimated. Uh, the tilt on it is extremely sensitive. And as a result of that, now oh, this thing here is only going in mono again. Hang on just a second. There's a bad setting here. I saw this earlier. I thought I'd already fixed it. That's the one right there. I'm going to restart this real quick. What I use to collimate the RAS is something called a photon cage, and that is a tilt adjuster for the camera in the front. And um, you know, the, it has a tilt adjuster in the cam uh, in the front where the camera is, and that adjusts the tilt of the sensor of the camera to the light path. Uh, on a RAS, it's critical that that be exactly square with the light path. It has to be perpendicular and it has that, that sensor has to be square to within seven microns. And you know, that's seven one thousandths of a millimeter. So it's a very, very fine adjustment. And with the photon cage by ASG Astronomy, uh, that's actually pretty easy to do, but it takes about an hour to do it the first time, just to get it perfect. Now, my my sensor on my RASA is is square to within five microns, and I could probably get it within two or three if I spent another hour on it. Uh, I you know there's a there's a point of diminishing returns for for me. You know, I like I like having it right, but by the same token, I actually like going out and imaging. You know, it's kind of like fly fishing. I don't know if anybody out there fly fishes, but one of the things that you do with a fly rod is you, is you bring the fly rod back and forth, and you throw a loop of line rather than throw the lure, which is the way you normally would use a fishing rod. But um, you have to throw a loop of, of line out. The problem is, is as you go back and forth from, from, two to, you know, from 10 to 2 and 10 to 2, you're not catching any fish because fish aren't above the, above the stream up in the air where your fly line is. You only catch fish when the fly's in the water. So you shouldn't do more than one or two casts to get your fly where you want it. If you're doing 12 casts, you're spending more time flipping your line around in the air than you are actually fishing. So it's kind of the same thing with focusing and, and doing collimation. You know, there, there's a point where good enough, you know, close enough is good enough. And trust me, I've reached that point a few times. So let's go get this cleaned up. Now down here we can normalize these curves and bring them into what's called white balance. And then we'll do a stretch on it. And you see the bubble nebula starting to emerge there. Start bringing out a little bit of detail. Now, the camera sensor that I'm using is extremely large. So you're starting to see the bubble here coming out. There's a lot of noise in the background. That's that kind of sandpapery look to the background. This looks like, looks like this is printed on sandpaper. 
that's noise. And even though this is a cooled camera, you're always going to have a little bit of noise in there. And that noise goes away with subsequent images. That's why we stack them. We stack one on, on, on top of the other. I've got two images here so far. But we're definitely starting to see some of the bubble nebula here. Now, if you compare that to what's in here, so you see the two stars right here and these two stars here. You know, you've got two stars in the bubble and then you have a star up at 10 and one at two. Let's see if we can find those in this image. So here are the stars that are within the bubble right here and then here are the ones right here. Come on. So right here is a, a star, right here is another star, and then here's the stars that's within the bubble. Now there's apparently two stars right there and we aren't resolving both of them just yet. We'll give that a couple more. We'll give that a couple more images and see if we can clear that up a little bit. But that's the bubble nebula right there. That doesn't look too bad. That's coming out nicely. We'll let, we'll let that stack for a little while and see what it looks like. Let's go back over here to the chat. Steve, you didn't bring the chat down, trust me. Everybody was thinking it when I was talking about my eight inches and the fact that I'm using 10 inches now. You know, as we say in, in aviation, there's no replacement for displacement. And aperture is king when it comes to telescopes. So the bigger, the better. But that's the bubble nebula coming through right now. Yeah, those two stars in the center are kind of merging. And then the, the other two stars you can pretty clearly see here. See, this is another star that you could see in the group. This one right here. If you look over here, you can see it on this one here. Um, if you go from the, the bubble out around two o'clock, about halfway out, you'll see one just off that line, right at the edge of the nebula. That's another one that we're seeing. And that's what the crosshairs are on right now. There's a lot more magnification in this particular telescope, this Mead, but the optics on it are not as nice as the optics on the RASA. And, um, you know, even though the, the Ritchie Crateon has less focal length at about 1,620 millimeters as opposed to 2,770, I think the images from the Ritchie Crateon are actually a little better. Uh, one thing that I may do with this in the not-so-distant future is I may put what's called a, a focal reducer on it and bring it from an F10 scope down to about an F7.5 or an F6.5. It'll, um, it'll reduce the magnification, but it'll flatten the field a bit, 
and it will um, it'll just make the scope itself look a, a little better overall. You're gonna make the image look better overall. See, there's actually a little bit of astigmatism with this. You know, those stars actually have little points on them. And that's because the quality of these optics are not quite as good as the quality of the optics on the RASA. One of these days, I'm going to get a 14-inch Ritchie Crateon. Or I'll get an edge. You know, I'll get a 14-inch edge or something. And uh, that'll have a little better optics on it. This is a very old telescope. It's a lot more primitive than some of the ones that I have right now, and it's also been modified some. So these are not astrophotography quality results, but I'm not really an astrophotographer. I actually measure little dots of asteroids and such. I do this for fun once in a while just to kind of demonstrate what's up there in the night sky. Hey, Chris. Yeah, this is the bubble nebula. For those of you that are interested, we're always looking for Patreons to the channel. Um, got a couple in here right now. You know, I appreciate the support of the channel. Um, you know, a uh, little donation every month goes a long way because it all goes directly into equipment. Right now, our goal is to finish paying off the, um, um, the telescope mount, the little AM5. And um, that's going to be the portable mount for outreach. And I also would very much like to get a solar telescope. Because here in Michigan, sometimes it's, it's nice during the day, but cloudy at night. Uh, for example, in the last two weeks, um, tonight is really the first night that I've had that I've had decent weather. I had a little bit of weather the other day that I could get the telescope out for a while, and the nice thing about having it set up in the dome, it basically means plugging in a, a cord and flipping a switch and turning on the computers. You know, there's not a lot of setup involved. But uh, I would like to have something that maybe I could, I could uh, stream um, hydrogen alpha from the sun, which is really cool, and that would be very nice for the upcoming solar eclipse as well. With the AM5 mount, which is the portable mount, I can put the solar telescope on that, go down to southern um, Illinois, where I went last time, and uh, that's going to be uh, right in the path of totality. And I'd like to be able to stream that. But, you know, the key to that is to be able to get a decent solar telescope so that I can do it safely and um, get some really cool images with it, with a, with a corona and everything else. So if anybody would like to uh, become a supporter of the observatory, I don't take any of the money out myself. It all goes directly into equipment for the observatory, which ends up getting, getting put out on YouTube as well. This channel makes about $7 a month, so it's not really a profitable channel. It's kind of a specialized um, audience that I stream these things to, people that are interested in this stuff. So if anybody would like to become a member, um, the link is right there in the, the link is right there in the um, description of this video. Now, one thing that I would like to do here, these are two-minute images. This is a very slow telescope. You know, as I said, it's an F10. Because my tracking is so good right now, I think what I may do is instead of going, uh, well, they're three, yeah, they're two-minute images. Let's go up to a four-minute image and see what that looks like. I think I tried these the other day and I wasn't getting much in the line of streaking. But let's go, go ahead and see whether or not 
we can get a little better image out of it. So we'll give that a couple of minutes to go. Let's go ahead and have a look at our tracking real quick. So you see our tracking is essentially flat. And even this whole time, we're tracking at a quarter of an arc second. And if you look over here at the bullseye right under the 5.36, all of our reference marks are right in that center circle. There's only one or two of them that are outside of it. So our tracking tonight is excellent. That's why we're getting such good clear images and such round stars even with long exposures. I do want to make sure that this cooling is on. Cooling is on and set to negative 20, that's good. After we're done taking a few images of the bubble nebula, I think that what I'm going to do is go over to M101, the pinwheel galaxy, and we'll have a look at that supernova that was discovered in May. I took some pictures of it early in May, or right about within about two weeks of it being discovered. And I compared them to some images I took about three weeks ago, and it's got some noticeable dimming. I wonder if that supernova is still visible. They said it was going to be visible through, um, through uh, September, but now that it's October, let's see if it's still out there. I'm betting it'll probably have some remnants on it, but we'll check it out here in a few minutes. So anybody have any questions or anybody um, have any targets they'd like to have a look at? Actually, the very first image this evening, Chris, was ruined by a satellite. Uh, it took a picture of the Iris Nebula. It has a nice big satellite trail going right through it. It truly is a problem. But generally, uh, it only ruins one frame at a time. And when you're taking uh, 45 to 60 frames, you can, you can stand to lose a couple of them. So it doesn't make that much of a difference. Um, very little in the line of astronomy is a single shot of anything. We generally take multiple shots and then stack them. Makes them much clearer and reduces, um, reduces noise and all sorts of other things. OK, Lubo, you want to see some comets? We'll have a look at the supernova, probably just a couple of shots to see if it's there. And then we're going to go find some comets tonight, because that's the main thing that I'm going to be doing. For the rest of the evening. Uh, I've got good weather for another two hours and I want to go ahead and get at least uh, one or two sessions against the comets. Looks like we've got an image coming up here shortly. See what the bubble nebula looks like at four minutes. I'm liking those stars already. Now we're actually seeing some of the rest of the bubble. Can you see the you see the circle of the bubble is starting to complete? Stars are not looking bad at all. You've got a blue star here too and you've got a couple of yellow stars, but that's a that's a blue star. That's a blue star in the bubble. Let's take a couple of images here and see if we can resolve that bubble a little bit better. But compare that to what Stellarium's got. 
So we're starting to see what's the top edge of the bubble here. Originally, we just saw this bottom edge. Of course, it's upside down compared to what I'm, I'm looking at. But we're starting to be able to pick out this bottom, you know, the, the top edge of this bubble here um, that's very faint. Looks like four minutes is a little better shot for this one. And I'll tell you, while we're letting this image go, I'm going to go over to the Minor Planet Center, and I'm going to call up some comets. And get some ephemeris for some comets so we can have a look at those. You know, I was actually looking at a uh, Netflix series this week. You know, I, I do like to look at that once in a while, and sometimes there are some series out there that I find interesting. And they've got a very nice one on Simon Bolivar. Uh, it's in Spanish with, uh, uh, with captions, English captions. So it gives me a chance to work on my Spanish a little bit, and I can see the translation right there. It's a very interesting historical uh, subject, but I found my hobby uh, intruding on it because every now and then they'll show a picture of the moon, and the moon's upside down compared to what I'm used to here in the northern hemisphere. And I mean, it really sticks out like a sore thumb. You can definitely tell that shot came from the southern hemisphere. Okay, I've got some comet targets here. So you see, with each subsequent 
image that we take, the background gets a little darker and a little more uniform in that bubble. See, you're starting to see some of the base of the bubble right in here. You know, if you look right around through here, you can start seeing that bubble coming out. Thank you, uh, Lubo. I'm going to have a look at your bubble nebula. I'm going to take this last image and then we'll go out and uh, have a look at the supernova real quick and then we're going to start looking for some comets. I'll probably find the first comet and then start imaging it and I'll probably uh, end the stream then and just basically continue it on Discord. Uh, when I'm doing imaging for things, you know, for, for measurements, I generally take 45 to 60 um, three to five minute images with this. And it's just basically a very slow thing to do. I mean, it's been kind of excruciating and we're getting ready to do the third image here. Imagine sitting through 45 to 60 of these. But that's what you need to do in order to get really nice um, um, data to recalculate the orbits of these comets and report them and update the orbital elements, which is what I do. Science is a long and tedious process, unfortunately. Generally, you don't take one picture and voila, there it is. Okay, so there's the final image. I could continue to image this for a few hours if my main goal tonight would be to uh, take these pictures. But unfortunately, um, I've got some work that I have to do uh, on, these, uh, on these comets. So let's go ahead and go over to uh, M101. I'm going to stop streaming or stop guiding. I'm going to go on over here. Let's turn that off for just a second. Let's drop our time down from four minutes to eight seconds. Basically, all we want to do with that is just. Um, do a quick plate solve to see where we are. So target. So what the telescope is doing now is it's slewing over, it's left the pinwheel galaxy here. And we should be heading over towards M101, which is actually kind of low on the horizon. We'll see whether or not we can get it.
Come on. That's a little out of focus now. Let's get a little better focus here. Let's run a quick focusing routine. We'll have a look at the pinwheel galaxy. Let's see what's going on up in the chat. So our next shot is going to be to the um, our next shot is going to be to the pinwheel galaxy. We're going to have a look and see if that supernova is still there, and then we're going to go have a look at some comets. Yeah, they can be that stupid, Libo. They absolutely can.
going to tighten up that focus a little.
All right, focus is a little bit better. I think that the I think that the pinwheel galaxy is in the upper left quadrant of this image, but it's not got enough stars because it's relatively low on the horizon, right next to some light pollution. It's not got enough stars to do a good plate solve on it. So we're going to kind of Kentucky windage this one. Then we're going to look for some comets. This is what happens when you look very low on the horizon, you know, around 30 degrees or so. Especially in an area that's got house lights or businesses and such. This is pointing right towards what we call Hamburger Hill here in town. So we've got McDonald's and Burger King and everything right up in that area and they've all got signage. Okay, let's go see what this image looks like. White. So I think, I think right here. It's where our galaxy is, but we're not just we're just not getting good images. I think that's the galaxy right there. But we're not getting good images that, at this angle here. So let's go ahead and have a quick look at a comet. I don't think that's going to be a good target for us tonight. See, I mean, even the histogram over here on the right, you know, I mean, this just doesn't look good to me. So let's go find a comet. Now, I pulled one up here a little while ago. So let's go ahead and put in the coordinates for this. Hey, Otis. So here are the coordinates, I'm putting those in. Now let's put the name in. Now what we're going to do is slew over to where the comet is. Looks like it's kind of taken the long, long roundabout way of getting there.
See, we've lost focus again here real quick. Hell. Just doing a quick focus run. So you can see the stars look like little donuts. They've got a dark spot in the center of them. That means they're out of focus. It's getting a little better. See, if you look on the right, you'd see it's starting to form a path. It's heading in the right direction. It's just not there yet. So I said our goal was to get it under two, but it generally doesn't quite get that low on the SCT.
get a little closer to focus. And I'm going to run that one more time. And I'm going to do a quick plate solve, and we're going to figure out how uh, where the comet is, and we're going to start taking some images. Yeah, this focus is getting a little balky tonight. Yeah, it's a mirror, it's a mirror image. There, we're moving in the right direction now.
Let's see if we can spot that comet. Give it a 30 second image and see what we have. It should be right in the center. Or very close. Well, that may be it right there. <laughs>